Good evening, everyone. My name is John Moser. I'm professor of history and chair of the Master of Arts of American History and Government program at Ashland University. Welcome to our third season of Documents in Detail, teachingamericanhistory.org's webinar series. In each episode, we're doing a deep dive into a single document discussing the historical, literary, and rhetorical aspects of said document while also analyzing its impact on uh, American history, people, and thought. TeachingAmericanHistory.org is a project of the Ashbrook Center, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization based at Ashland University. We provide a variety of programs and resources for teachers of American history, government, and civics, all based on primary documents. In the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of, of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from tonight's program. The topics of this year's webinars are drawn from speeches, letters, and writings from the Ashbrook Center's extensive document database available at TAH.org. You too can participate in the discussion by typing your questions into the chat window at the bottom of your screen at any time, and we'll do our best to get to all your questions. The subject of tonight's program is excerpts from James Madison's Notes of Debates in the Federal Convention of 1787. And to help discuss those excerpts are Dr. Jeremy Bailey, professor of political science at the University of Houston, and I learn uh, until recently holder of the Ross M. Lentz Distinguished Teaching Chair, uh, as well as Dr. Gordon Lloyd, senior fellow of the Ashbrook Center and professor emeritus at Pepperdine University. And uh, first of all, I feel like I must apologize because already I am breaking Jeremy's uh, that advice to me that I should keep my voice kind of quiet. I don't know how to do that. I hope I didn't blur blast out anyone's eardrums during that introduction. Anyway, Jeremy Gordon, it's lovely to have you here tonight. Um, why don't we just get started with a general question? What's so important about this reading? Jeremy, yeah. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, what's so important about this reading? Um, primarily, it's our best. It's almost our only account of the goings on in the Convention of 1787, which gave us our Constitution. Um, by releasing it posthumously, James Madison um, put himself as uh, a kind of authority figure on the records of the Constitution. So the simple answer to your question, it's, it's the best record we have of what happened at the Constitutional Convention. All right. Um, I should mention, as we turn to, uh, to Gordon Lloyd, that these excerpts come from Gordon's own edition of the, uh, of the notes on the debates. Um, Gordon, do you uh, we care to add to anything uh, Jeremy has said? Uh, perhaps maybe focus on these particular readings, why these excerpts of the entirety of the, of the, of the notes, these excerpts are particularly worth paying attention to? Well, I think Jeremy's point about being the best is very well taken. Uh, and that's why sometimes they're attacked, because they are the best, hmm. in order to undermine some kind of coherent and relevant account of, of the founding. Matt, uh, we will get into, I'm sure we will get into the, the, the doctor's notes, etc. But yeah, I agree with there, Jeremy. It is, they are the best, they're most comprehensive, and at, in, when I get uh, in my wildest Southern California dreams, I even compare it to Plato's Republic. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that uh, Plato wrote the best regime, the Republic, in one sort of drunk in the evening, and we don't have a problem about whether it actually occurred or not. But Madison actually took these accounts and turned it into a conversation. There are other accounts, but it's not the quite, it's not the level of, of, of Madison's account. Madison actually, whether it happened precisely in that way or not, recreated a conversation that took place over 88 days. Never before in the history of the world had that happened, and then been subjected to consent of the governed. At Madison, to be sure, he worked on them over the years, 
I have no idea how long Plato worked on his Republic, but Madison's Republic had 50 plus participants. Not a drop of blood was spilled. So I agree. Jeremy said it very eloquently and very briefly, the best. And I've said it more clumsily and <laughs> lengthily as to why I agree that it's the best. What other accounts are uh, are extant um, that, that could be compared against this? And, and, and obviously not as complete as Madison's, but uh, uh, what other uh, uh, notable accounts are there? Well, it's Yates, who came <clears throat> from uh, New York, but then Yates, along with Lansing uh, from New York, they left... Uh, before the, a lot of people would consider it to be the critical event, the Connecticut Compromise in the middle of July. So if, if you're looking for some, some other delegate's account, Yates might come close. And he gave from, he gave pretty much the whole of June and into early July. Uh, but it, it is not the, he didn't create a conversation. And, and, and so I think that's, that's what we have to deal with, the notion of you can actually follow a conversation in, in Madison. You've got McHenry, who stayed there and, and left and came. Hamilton's uh, jottings from his June 18th speech, which lasted all day, there, he, he's got that there. So there are these various people who took down records, whether for their own private use or not, we don't know, <clears throat> uh, well, for sure. But no one sat down with the idea of writing for posterity. Mm -hmm. uh, well, at least that's what Madison claimed. Okay. When he published them posthumously, he was writing for posterity so that people could look back on this uh, rather uh, miraculous event or strange event uh, that had never occurred before. So I don't think there's anything, I think Jeremy's right, there's nothing to compare with that. And even the critics of Madison's coverage, like James Hudson, would agree that that Madison's coverage, but Ferran uh, is unwilling to let Madison's coverage speak for itself. And so he includes everything else. And any scholar who's worth being a scholar has got to consider uh, Ferran's complete records, which have been updated by Hudson. But it's nothing to compare as a narrative, as a story, as an account of the creation of the Republic, like what Madison has done. Okay. Uh, we have a question. Um, Larry Fada asks, I was under the impression that the participants in the convention had sworn to never divulge details of the proceedings. Is that why Madison released them posthumously? Uh, if not, what was his reasoning for doing so? What did the other participants think of this? Uh, Jeremy. Yeah, so uh, we don't know what the other participants thought of it in the sense that they were all dead when he released it. Um, the, um, I, th I think there is, um, well, let's, let's put it this way. Matt Madison had a rather uh, strict interpretation of what the oath of secrecy uh, required. Um, he uh, was uh, annoyed frequently when um, excerpts uh, by Yates came out, uh, and, and 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 he was also annoyed when it, when the records of the kind of the voting, the voting records of the convention or the journal of the convention were also released, and he 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 was pretty impatient or, or, or uh, annoyed by this. Um, he had a rather strict view of what the oath of secrecy required, and that meant uh, that he had to had to hold on to it until everyone was dead, including himself. Uh, now, what, does that mean that he violated the oath in his death? I suppose one 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 might say that. Um, I'm not sure that they sort of thought about the details of the oath, or even that Madison thought of the details of the oath to, to, to that regard. But but I've heard people make that criticism. Okay. Um, I, I do want to get into the uh, into the these specific excerpts, but but the, another uh, Larry has another very good question about uh, about the notes in general, specifically about how Madison went about writing them. Um, was he so skilled in taking notes of, of, of these detailed conversations as they were ongoing? Uh, have we seen the actual notes on which 
the 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 notes that in this volume are based how much refinement i guess would be a, a way of asking it, what was there in and what ended up in the book gordon you might be the one to answer that yeah, uh, there's a long and difficult <clears throat> history uh, answer to that uh, to that very very straightforward question madison took jottings every day and he said he never missed a day or he never missed part of a day for very long so that his claim is that he attended every day and he took down jottings and you could follow the story through the twists and the turns that went on and he worked on it for quite some time and until his death and i would think that there are several, excuse me, versions, and excuse me, I don't want to get into that issue at the moment, because I'm sure we'll get into it later on about which version is which and why and such and such, but he worked on this, as Jeremy has suggested, for over 30 years, and what we see at the end is his final version. And there's a debate concerning, do we go with his original notes, which he jotted down on the day of the, of, of the discussion, or do we go with his final version, which he um, let me publish posthumously? Now, there's a no, there's 30 something years in between the initial initial scribblings for his memory and uh, the polished version at the end for posterity to read. And uh, I think there's lots to talk about in between the day-by-day -day jottings and the final polished version for posterity. Okay. Uh, look, can I ask a question real quick there of Gordon? Yes. Um, so uh, what, what do those jottings look like and, and how, and, and do we have access to them or, um, uh, do they exist? Yeah. Yeah. They, the, the answer is yes, they do, but it's very difficult to tell <laughs> whether they are original, original jottings or they have been, uh, they've been scribbled over oh. so that, I mean, I think the point you made when about Yates's notes coming out needs to be uh, needs to be expanded. Uh, it's at eight, roughly eighteen eighteen. Yeah. Madison is leaving the presidency. John Quincy Adams is commissioned to put together the record of the convention and he asked Madison and Madison says no. And, and Jeremy has told us why, because he has a very strict interpretation. <laughs> but uh, so, so, this re so this record, this record comes out in, in, in Yates's notes, the journal comes out and then Madison's, so there's a version number one which is 1787 to 1818. And yes, you can see the 1787 jottings, but then they are revised. So version number one is actually 1787 to 1818. And then version number two is Madison in retirement after its presidency and John Quincy Adams coming up with these documents, sitting down in his final days and producing this posthumous, which I would call the transcript edition. And that is even messed up, marked up by Gilpin, who was the editor. So I think it's extremely difficult to tell, is there a completely true original version? But you know what? That's a whole argument that people get into that I don't find to be overwhelmingly exciting because when you read the early version, which is more scribbly and correcting, and the later version, which is more eloquent and platonic and dialogue form, 
you get the same message. You know who the good guys are. You know who the bad guys are. You know what the issues are. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's get more into uh, these specific uh, excerpts. After all, um, the, full, the full book is several hundred pages, and we have here, uh, I don't know, depending on which, how, how, how your printer is set up, something like five or six. Why focus specifically on these, uh, on, the, on the issues raised here, when obviously there is so much of, 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 of huge importance that came out of the Constitutional Convention. All right. So I, I didn't, since I didn't pick the selection, I'll take a stab at it. So what, what I saw when, when, when I read it and um, which, you know, would lead me to somebody who's thought about this and say, okay, why did somebody pick these? I, I see two things. Um, one is, well, actually maybe three things. Uh, one has to do with the question of, um, who should rule, and you might say, how elite will the Constitution be? Uh, is this Constitution going to be a, um, uh, a, a setup for, for elites to rule over ordinary people? Or to put it differently, how, how much uh, did the men of the Convention trust ordinary people? So that's a theme that is developed uh, in part in, the, in these documents through the question of representation and the selection of the first Chamber of Cong Cong Congress. The second thing that's there lurking behind that question is the debate between the small states and the large states. And so you get a good introduction to that theme that's lurking right there. And so I like the way that the two interplay in, in, this, in this selection. And then finally, you get the, uh, the contest over the large republic and the small republic and then the wonderful exchange between Sherman and Madison. Yeah, okay. Gordon. Well, just to pick up on on Jeremy's last point, I mean, if you're a political theorist, June the sixth is going to be very important. And if you want to, uh, why? Because they've gone through the Virginia plan, and now they're going to go through it again. So, so what? So I, I mean, June the sixth. So what's at stake here now? So, so what's the issue? We've gone through these various proposals. So what's at stake? And Sherman says people are happier in, in small communities. And Madison says, no, they're not. They're more miserable and, and, and tyrannized. So you've got sort of the theoretical, the political theoretical issue. Are people happier and, by implication, freer? in small homogeneous communities or in large diverse communities and that's a debate madison has stated that thesis before but within the american context no one as far as i know has taken him on and sherman who is not a political theorist of the of a, sort of the status that madison but he's a realist takes him on so Here's the issue. So I agree with Jeremy that June the 6th is important because they've gone through the first round and now they get to the issue. I also think that uh, and that needs to be settled uh, in terms of are we going to be a large commercial extended republic or a small, more homogeneous republic. And, and then... I, again, Jeremy's correct. Representation. Right? Who or what is going to be represented? Madison starts off by saying uh, consent of the governed. Sherman starts off with saying the states are there. We're not starting with a clean slate. You just can't wipe them out. They're there. And so he proposes on June the 11th, well, why don't we cut a deal? First chamber for for the uh, for representation of the people, second chamber for representation of the states, and Madison is furious. Well, I mean, we've come all this way to uh, and, and do this, and and then the South Carolina delegation throws a curve. Well, how about wealth? We have something particular that that threesome: population, states, wealth slash slavery becomes the conversation from June the 11th until July the 16th with the Connecticut Compromise. 
is created. So I think following that issue out as a very, very American issue, I doubt that you'd thought that that issue would occur in Britain. I doubt that that issue would occur in other countries. That's a very American. And I think right. for people to sit down and follow that, they think, my goodness, aren't they getting away? Where, my, it, it, it's been done for five days. They haven't made any progress. Well, so why is making progress part of discussion? Mm. I mean, it could be very, very debilitating, the de deliberative process. So you learn yeah. about the ups, the downs, the comings, the goings of what it means to engage in a deliberation. Some people say, ah, oh, I'm fed up, I'm going to leave, or I'm going to threaten to leave. Some people say, well, I don't join the foreign power. Other people like Hamlet say, I'm going home. Go when you get serious, stop playing in the sandbox, give me a call. <laughs> okay. Madison say, I have to stick it out as long as you... Listen, I can drink Philadelphia beer. I don't have to drink the water. <laughs> Nicole Spencer uh, is, uh, is struck by a comment fairly early in this document um, by James Wilson. Um, Mr. Wilson contended strenuously for drawing the most numerous branch of the legislature immediately from the people. He was for raising the federal pyramid to a considerable altitude and for that reason wished to give it as broad a base as possible. The question is, what does he mean by that? Is he addressing the, the power and prestige of the United States or the power of the federal government itself? Well, I think very quickly, uh, um, <clears throat> I think we need to, to realize that there, there is, albeit weak or imbecile or in, in, in bad shape, a government, Articles of Confederation, and the pillars of the articles are the states that there is no connection between the people and the government that is the states are equally represented in one chamber under the articles and i think what wilson is getting at is we need to alter that structure and connect have federal pillars Okay. Uh, which, which means, in other words, that we need to have a different kind of relationship between the union, the central government, and the people. We don't want to dial through the states in order to get to the people. Jeremy, do you care to add to or amplify or subtract from what uh, what Gordon has said? Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, amplify it, I think. Um, the, the pyramid uh, metaphor in Wilson has, has received lot, lots of commentary. Um, it's a really striking image. Um, I think that the simplest uh, thing to notice is that he basically uh, is advocating for something closer to a unitary system as opposed to a federal system that um, because he wants to lift the center of power higher that means it needs a broader base, and that broader base he understands as popular selection rather than using the states as the uh, units of selection. Um, so you remove the states as intermediaries. So when Uncle Sam acts, Uncle Sam would act directly on you. When you vote, you, you vote directly for Uncle Sam. Um, I think that that's the idea. Um, I think we could say more about Wilson in a second. I'm, I'm not convinced that that's all that's going on right there, but I'll, I'll maybe maybe leave it to where, where the conversation goes. Um, who were who the most uh, influential political thinkers for the men who, who, were, who appear in these excerpts? Uh, I, 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 I understand that, uh, I think I'm, I'm right in saying that um, uh, Montesquieu was a, was a favorite of, of many of them. What other uh, what what other uh, political thinkers could be named as having having had a, a, sub a substantial influence on these men? I, I'll answer it really quickly. I was just looking at this today. My 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 former colleague Don Lutz, who taught at the University of Houston forever, wrote a very famous article published in 1984 in the American Political Science Review that did a quantitative analysis of citations by by American founders, and Montesquieu was the clear winner. Um, I believe the person who came in second was Blackstone, um, and the surprise, I think, finding was that, and, and it's not a surprise given it was Lutz who did it, was that John Locke was relatively 
uh, far behind uh, Montesquieu and Blackstone and, and and the citations list. And so Lutz thought that with the, with, uh, that indicated that 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 Locke had given too much credit. I disagree with Lutz on that point. I think that Locke is is, is up there, perhaps further than than Montesquieu in terms of his influence. But um, it would be Montesquieu, Locke, Blackstone. Uh, there are some others, but those are the big ones. Could it be that Locke is so deeply embedded in the in the discourse of the time that there's no reason to cite him? It's, it's just part of the common uh, part of the common vocabulary. Yeah, it could be, uh, and uh, it also could be where you're looking. Uh, if you're thinking about revolutionary documents, Locke is your guy, but not so much when creating a constitution, uh, at least uh, arguably. Uh, but. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think I think the 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 the, the deference to Locke, um, you know, which there's some bleed over between Montesquieu and Locke. So just for example, take the dictum that the legislative and executive powers have to be separate, that they can be operated by the same people. Well, those are that's both Locke and Montesquieu. Right. And then the Americans just subscribe to that without question. Uh, and mm -hmm. so who do you credit for that doctrine? Well, well both. Gordon, care to care to add on, add anything to that? Uh, I, what I, I I think Jeremy's um, appreciation of what Don has done, and his critique of Don is is um, is accurate. I, I I agree with both the praise and the critique. Uh, if you look at the use of Blackstone and Montesquieu, it's largely in the ratification debates and in the pamphlet discussion. I cannot remember Montesquieu and Blackstone playing a big part in the Constitutional Convention, and nor can I imagine, I, I, nor can I remember Locke. But what they're trying to do is to create a foundation at the convention for legitimate government. And so Locke uh, is there in the background, as you suggest, uh, John. It, uh, Montesquieu, and when I read Montesquieu and Blackstone through the eyes of the framers, I'm not looking at uh, how do we create a government based on the consent of the governed. I'm reading how do we have the rule of law and the separation of powers. When I read Locke through the eyes of the framers, I'm reading how do we base a government on the consent of the governed? And I think that that issue is what is driving the Constitutional Convention and leads to ratification based on consent. So I think Don Lutz's work about citations and everything is correct. And that and certainly when it gets to the ratification and the debates, the anti-federalists are going to pull up Blackstone or particularly Montesquieu to show that what the Constitution is doing is deviating from Montesquieu. Mm -hmm. And that's what we understand by separation of powers, or that's what we understand by federalism, or that's what we understand by republicanism. Although I, that's not what Sherman cites at the at convention. In fact, what I'm amazed at is how little during the convention there is a reliance on outside sources. They're relying on their discussions themselves or their own experience, which I'm sure is deep, but, and their reading is deep. Mm -hmm. But you don't find this long, these huge paragraphs that you do find in the ratification debates about citing this person and citing that and citing the other and this notion of confederacies here and that on the... Uh, it's, don't we have a vote? Don't we have a proposal on the table? Is, um, is it fair to say that there was a, a, a considerable variation among the men at the convention in terms of, of what they read and how much. I mean, you know, Roger Sherman, Gordon, you mentioned was, was not a man of, of, of political theory. Uh, he was, uh, I guess they say in the musical 1776, a simple cobbler from Connecticut. Um, was, how much, did, how much did, did, did people like Roger Sherman know about this this rich historical or this rich theoretical literature 
Well, I mean, all of them, <laughs> if you say, did they attend college? Yeah, most of them attended college. One of the people who, who, who failed was Hamilton. <laughs> uh, but they did, and they <clears throat> attending college then is not exactly the same as attending college now. I mean, they they read they were at fifth, age fifteen, and they read deeply. So I'm sure it's in their soul, it's in their mind. But mm -hmm. I don't see them having a deep conversation like. Plato would have uh, about this, that, and the other. I mean, it's in them, it's there, and they, and they say, well, how about this? I mean, when Sherman says people are happier in smaller places, he doesn't cite Montesquieu, or put it this way, Madison doesn't report Sherman citing Montesquieu. Ah, all right. Um, uh, Jeremy, any, uh, any thoughts on this? Um, so I just think about Sherman, I mean, he, I think, I think he had experience doing some tinkering with the Connecticut Constitution uh, beforehand. So, so even you know, if he's a simple cobbler, he had, he had thoughts about constitutional design, constitutional reform. Uh, I spent some time thinking about um, Sherman in the context of the Connecticut Constitution or Charter um, recently. Um, another thing is, um, so I'm, I'm right now I'm looking at this um, phrase that appears in Federalist 70. It's quoted all the time about secrecy, vigor, expedition, dispatch, or, or something like that. Uh, it's a string of four words uh, associated with unity of the executive. It turns out that that uh, sentence comes directly from a British moral philosopher uh, who published a, a book in 1785, which, uh, his name's Paley, which quickly uh, was assigned at, at Cambridge as, as, as the, as the go-to book in moral philosophy. And, and, and within the next decade, the United States was, was widely assigned to most, mo many universities. Um, hmm. I say all that to say is that I think that a lot of them would have had um, books like that of Paley, and that would be accounts that were meant to popularize uh, and disseminate certain philosophic truths in the same way that... Um, Students used to read maybe Isaiah Berlin or John Stuart Mill or Daniel Webster in ways that you get the basic building blocks of liberal constitutional theory uh, or theories of tolerance uh, in, in a university education today. I think they would have been familiar via that way. And then as working lawyers, they would have known their Blackstone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, Nicole Spencer has uh, another question. Uh, about Madison, right? And this is going back to the exchange between Sherman and Madison. Sherman says, look, I, I can't imagine the federal government is going to do very much. Real sovereignty should stay with the states. Uh, and then Madison says, well, not so fast. A and then he goes into uh, an argument that's immediately recognizable to anyone who's read Federalist 10. Um, uh, in fact, much of this is a discussion of the, the value of enlarging the sphere. Uh, uh, Nicole asks whether this is a result of Madison's later polishing, or did he was he did he hold these views at the time of the uh, uh, of the convention itself, if not earlier? Well, it, it, this is a controversy right now. I. I am, I'm of the opinion that he held those views prior to going to the convention. You can read his vices of the American system, which I think is his working paper as to what is wrong and what needs to be done. Uh, you can read the exchange which he had with Washington and with Randolph before he went to the convention as what he thought was wrong and what needs to be done. And he comes, uh, he doesn't introduce it until June the 6th because uh, from the end of May to June the 5th, they go through the various propositions of the Virginia plan and so they say, all right, so, so, what's, so what's at stake? And then he repeats. So I don't think he invented it at, on that day. I think it's been around for... Uh, a good three, four months at Madison thinking through the inadequacies, if we have to say, of Montesquieu, the inadequacies, although he never mentions them by name, the inadequacies of the ancient way of thinking about these things, 
and the opportunity which a different way um, offers. And, and so I know that, that, that it's been claimed that Madison doctored and introduced it. Here's the one thing somewhere down the line, I, I'm writing about it, I don't know where I'm going with it, but the, 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 there's a similarity between Madison's vices, which he says, which in fact means what's wrong with the system. And he spends the longest time on what's wrong with the state legislatures it's what, and majority faction. Okay. And that's written in the, in, in, in the winter of 1787. And so are the letters to Washington and Randolph. Then he goes to the convention and it's this June 6th speech. And then in October, when it's all over, he summarizes everything to Jefferson. And then we get to the end of the year and Federalist 10 is written. So Federalist 10 comes at the end of this whole series of thoughts, uh, <coughs> etc. Now, what strikes me is the following. In the June 6th speech, he mentions slavery as an issue which is a huge divide. He does not mention that in the vices. He does not mention that in Randolph's letters or the Washington letter, and he does not mention that in Federalist 10. He does say it to Jefferson in the October letter that South Carolina was uh, adamant uh, that we wouldn't have passed. So I think if, you, if one wants to play around with the different versions of this theme, I think it would be valuable to play around with what's there and what's not there in the different versions. I just don't, I, I, mean, I can't buy this, uh, build a notion that, that all of a sudden June the 6th is pushed in there by Madison at the last minute and it, 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 <clears throat> to please Jefferson. Why the heck would Madison want to please Jefferson with a statement of the commercial republic? I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that I think what Builder is doing is raising the question of what is the status of political theory at the, at, at, at the convention? And what is the status of any document that we might want to refer to? I think Builder is part of the unfortunate situation now is it be, that it becomes extremely difficult to study Madison's coverage without being involved in Supreme Court nominations and original intent. Mm. Madison didn't have anything in mind about Supreme Court nominations when he, when he posthumously left us. Why can't we? <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah, um, so, so the, the question, I, I presume, um, uh, comes from some familiarity with this book by Mary Builder, who's a law professor at Boston College. And... Uh, I agree with everything that Gordon said. I'll, I'll just maybe say, say it briefly in, in a slightly different uh, way. Um, first of all, I think Gordon is very right to point out that her project seems to be mostly about trying to undermine the status of originalism. Um, she had the, I think, the nifty discovery, if you can call it that, of, of noticing uh, the use of different paper uh, in Madison's notes and suggesting that different she, she, she draws the conclusion that different bits of Madison's notes come at different times and the different paper uh, reveal uh, additions that were put in later for various reasons. Um, in addition to that really big argument, she included another really big argument, which is that Federalist 10, the June 6th speech was added later so that, we'll, so that Madison could claim credit after the fact for this discovery when in fact he got it from somebody else at the convention. She then goes on to say that he doctored the vices, which is the earlier text, uh, because this is also that piece of the vices was written also on that different paper. So that all sounds relatively good so far. But what she didn't realize is that she's wading into uh, a field um, uh, in which people have been thinking about Fed 10 for a long time. And she didn't seem to be aware of the letter to Washington, hmm. uh, which uh, happens before 
uh, the convention. So she has zero explanation for the letter to Washington, and she has still not answered critics who've asked her to to explain that that problem with, with her story away. I would also point to the letter to Jefferson, which is October, as Gordon did, which gives the, the, the speech again. And so I think the better feeling, and Gordon alluded to this, is that in 1787, this is Madison's big idea, and any chance he gets, he's kind of blurting it out. So right in the middle of the letter to Jefferson, which is describing what happened at the convention, he gives the Fed 10 argument. And then he says, please excuse me for this immoderate digression. Let me get back to explaining what happened. Um, and, and the Federalist also reads like that. In Federalist 10, it just comes out of the blue. It's Madison's first entry. Uh, he's mostly writing in, in, a, in a series from, from number 37 to 63, approximately. Uh, there's some outliers beforehand. And 10 is the first one. And it's, again, boom, here's my big idea. And so I think that's a, a much better explanation of what's going on, that Madison is very proud of this discovery, and he's uh, in, uh, using it as, as much as he can. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, think, I think Builder's just wrong on this one. I have a, there's a question from Stacy Moses. Uh, she says that one of the problems that she has in talking to her students about these documents is, is, is to convey the idea that the framers all have kind of a common understanding on, on certain ideals and 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 what terms mean and, and beliefs that they uh, that they they shared um, can uh, either or both of you speak to the commonly held ideas that perhaps weren't even noticeable to them uh, also which of these agreed upon ideas were radical for the time and might even need to be retaught today like natural rights republicanism consent of the governed popular sovereignty etc I do for I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll give a quick short answer if Gordon's not going to. Uh, I would say independent judiciary, separation of powers, uh, government rest on consent. Um, these would all be assumed by 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 men there. Uh, go ahead, Gordon. Well, and then they disagree about how separate to have it separate, mm -hmm. how independent the judiciary should be. Should it be independent of, of the political branches, independent of the people? And that's what the debate is. I think a, a, a good debate can happen if you agree on certain principles. They're not going to be, they're not going to be monarchists. They're not going to be uh, at least no titles of nobility. So if we go back to an early Jeremy point about uh, trust in the common people and the elitism, I mean, that's, a, that's sort of like a first world problem. That's not the feudalistic. You know, so we're talking about elites, not not lords, which is a different sort of status altogether. Um, uh, hopefully, elites can uh, collapse. Lords apparently just pass on their land to somebody else. So I think that there is a, a commonality about we're going to be a republic. Every single state, uh, I mean, if you look at the declaration, it's the right of the people to choose that form of government under which they shall live. If we look at it, well, every single gov every single state chose something called, quote, a republic. Now, not every single state uh, uh, um, conformed to the same kind of institutional uh, or whatever else we want to do, electorate uh, arrangement under republic. But I knew they were a republic. And in those days, the choice was a republic or a monarchy. And monarchy was archi rule. Mono is monolithic, ruled by one, and res publica, the public public good. So that there was an open-endedness, at least in terms of the language, about well, what kind of public good? Did it mean annual elections? Did it mean biannual elections? Did it mean where did elections fit in, consent of the government? So I think the key difference was we're going to be a, rep the key point was we're going to be a republic and not a monarchy. And I think people like Hamilton would say, but, but don't forget that there's something to be said for monarchy. In fact, Madison said so too. And what can be said about monarchy is you could play one interest off against another. And you mm -hmm. could also have something called good government by attracting ambitious people to do important things. So 
I think what is open then and open now is, uh, is if to, to, re, to, to revisit Franklin's question, Franklin's point, so Mr. Franklin, what did you create? A republic, madam, if you can keep it. But then you have to understand what a republic is. Okay. Uh, another question is uh, from Larry Fata. I have a question concerning the impact on the notes or of the notes at the time of their of their publication. Uh, obviously, we have the Federalist Papers from the ratification debates, and then uh, the various antagonistic debates among Madison, Hamilton, Jefferson, etc. in the uh, in the early Republic. What was the impact in political circles at the time of the publication? Well, I, my, my answer is slavery. They, they didn't come out until the 1830s, 1840s. So the debates at the, uh, in, in the beginning, Federalist, Anti-Federalist, Hamilton, Jefferson, uh, Adams, etc., were contemporaneous. As Jeremy has pointed out, Madison's debates were posthumously published. And when they were he had hoped to avoid yeah. his debates becoming part of a political controversy. But when they were published, they became part of a political controversy. And that was, where does the Constitution stand on slavery? So it was those sections that, were, that, 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 that uh, garnered the most attention at the time. Well, if we would look at, uh, yeah. Um, yes, I would say uh, in the 1840s 18, to the 1850s, they weren't particularly concerned about the Connecticut Compromise. They weren't particularly concerned about uh, the 1808 slave trade clause. That, that, slavery, that, that, that slave trade clause is already gone. It was 1808. Um, they weren't particularly interested what I mean by they, the, the political actors of the day, as they distinguished from scholars who wanted to read Madison, and the idea that Madison thought that citizens would sit down and read this is absolutely fascinating to me. That, but that, and, and that they thought they, that, that this might not become part of the fodder, is that immediately, um, Abolitionists said, see, the Constitution is anti-slavery, and garrison forces say, see, the Constitution is pro-slavery. And that's how it remained basically through the Civil War. And again, I find it fascinating that, the, 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 that what happened to Madison's debates didn't become a citizen's reflection on the founding, but rather fodder in a slavery, anti-slavery uh, debate uh, during the 40s. And Madison was, was <laughs> funny. Anyway, Builder doesn't think that the, the, the notes are authentic. Garrison and the abolitionists didn't raise that question. The notes are, <laughs> Madison's debates are authentic. They prove it. They mm. prove that the founders were this way or that way. And then, I've always pondered, I have a hunch, but forget it. Uh, Tawny in his Dred Scott decision doesn't cite Madison to debates. And, uh, but he has them. Lincoln doesn't cite Madison's debates, but he has them. They're aware that people are talking about them. Certainly Garrison and the neo-Garrisons are and the anti-Garrisons are. Uh, the South doesn't cite Madison as support for slavery. So I'm just sitting back here as an observer saying, what the heck happened? So, uh, Jeremy, can you, can you uh, add to this or amplify? Yeah, so um, on, on the prior question, too, about the messiness, um, there, there, there's, a, there's a point I'd like to sort of blend with this. Um, and so this the person asked about uh, how do you, Basically, how do you teach this when you when if you want to teach the students a unifying theme? And and uh, my, my answer as a teacher is that it's very difficult. Every time that I teach the, the notes, uh, I struggle with uh, what the payoff is for, for for students because as opposed to say teaching the Federalist Papers, which is a clean uh, presentation of what the Constitution means, 
um, there's, there's an underlying messiness to, to, to the notes. Now, what comes through, I think, if you do want to see something, is that there are um, different uh, opinions about um, uh, the location of sovereignty in the United States. Does it come through the states or does it come through the people? We even see this in our excerpt today. Well, that's not really surprising, given our history. Uh, that, that seems to be an enduring uh, debate in, in our constitutional tradition. You can, you know, go over to Philadelphia to, to, the, to the National Constitution Center and see their multimedia presentation about we the people. And then, you know, they, 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 they say we the people about 55 times. Um, but that's not doesn't change the fact that there's a whole lot of people in this, in this tradition who believe that the states are the primary units. And some of those people have voices in Madison's uh, notes. Now, to go to impact, I thought, wow, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer to it, um, which I think that sounds like a really good mag thesis or somebody ought to do some more work on it. Because my first thought was, well, gosh, Lincoln doesn't quote it, and I can't think of anybody else who's quoting it. And I'm, I'm glad that um, Gordon mentioned the Garrisonians. Um, Madison um, didn't want to publish the notes while he's alive, in part because of the strict construction of the oath of secrecy, but also because, as Gordon said, he thought that it would become intertwined with the partisan politics of his day and thereby uh, lessen its impact. Hmm. Now, the things that he had in mind were disputes over the Bank of the United States, disputes over internal improvements, uh, disputes uh, over the tariff. And so these are questions about a broader strict con construction of the Constitution. Uh, and he thought, uh, Jefferson thought, that Madison's notes th had the secret to the question of the bank, and that is that it wasn't um, um, uh, a, 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 a power of Congress in Article One, Section 8. So I would be interested on the question of impact to know actually, okay, what happened in the hands of uh, Whigs and Democrats in the 1840s with respect to questions, uh, not only with respect to slavery, but that are also still ongoing, having to do with internal improvements and, of course, the question of, of the tariff, because that's really the dominant policy question of the century. Wow, that'd be that'd be a great topic. Uh, but but maybe I misunderstood you. Um, on the one hand, uh, it sounds as though his, his Madison's reluctance to have them to publish during his lifetime was he didn't want uh, he didn't want it to get caught up be you know get caught up in in current political uh, controversies. On the other hand, it sounds like that was exactly his intent in publishing it. Well, that those, controver that those controversies would have been changed. Um, I, I guess my point is, is he, from, from, from the controversy with Hamilton in 1791 onward, Madison and then Je Jefferson, because Jefferson saw the text, thought that Madison's text demonstrated the meaning of the Constitution of the bank, that they were right and Hamilton was wrong. Okay. And they would refer to this uh, from time to time in, in, in their, in their uh, public arguments about the bank. But of course, they never produced this evidence because it was it was secret evidence. Mm -hmm. And so but they, they knew that everybody at the convention knew they were right and that Washington knew they were right. And Washington had done a really terrible thing inside with Hamilton, even though that Washington should have known better because he was there. Um, that's to say that there was there were there were immediately political or partisan um, problem or, or questions that might be answered by the notes. Uh, and by holding on to them, Madison thought he would diminish uh, the extent to which the notes would become uh, merely associated with those partisan questions. Because he, he didn't want that to happen. Uh, and my, my question would be is, is uh, did holding on to it actually work? Or did they uh, become enmeshed in um, uh, partisan questions of the day in spite of Madison's attempts? Yeah. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, would each of you like to say a few words uh, in summary, perhaps uh, telling uh, there are these fine teachers out there why they should be assigning this reading to their students? Jeremy? Yeah, so take the selection um, and, and we have. Um, uh, to me, and uh, Gordon might disagree with me here, this is, this is um, sort, sort of the way I've been thinking about this, this recently, mm -hmm. is you, you take this question of, let's say, elite versus uh, ordinary people rule. So, so ordinary people versus elites, that, that comes up. Um, and it's, it's a very important question, and it's been an, an ongoing question, the way we think about this document um, for about a century now. 
I, I am starting to, to, to read this as um, these are um, the primary question is not that question, but it's rather the primary question is that the sides are, 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 are drawing up around the question of large state versus small state. And so when you see Wilson talk and you see Sherman talk, that these are, uh, in a way, I don't want to reduce them to proxy arguments. So I don't want to be reductive in saying this, but I do want to say that the small state, large state is A, very difficult to disentangle, and B, might even be primary. And so as just in teaching this, I think it's an, it's an interesting opportunity for um, students, very good students, to grapple with how they think about arguments. Uh, arguments are made uh, at the level of principle. They're also made at the level of interest. There are high, lo high road arguments and there are low road arguments. You don't always have to choose between the two. They actually can sometimes interact and tell you uh, clues about the other. Uh, anyway, so that's what I would say. Gordon. I agree. There are high road arguments and low road arguments, and that's been a, a, sort of an approach I've taken for uh, many, many years. And every time I reread the convention, I try to read it innocently, although I know it's very difficult to read it innocently. And that's one piece of advice I would <clears throat> try to give to teachers to encourage their students. Read it innocently. Put to one side what it is that you think is there and read it as if you have never read it before, which of course you haven't read it before, which is the whole Ashbrook point about introducing you to original documents. Uh, the other thing is, I think that, once again, Jeremy is correct that um, he's right. I would disagree in, in part. Uh, I think this elitism versus the people business is a 20th century progressive watered down version of Charles Beard, the upper, the upper class capitalist versus uh, innocent proletarians who are being shafted. And I think that kind of model of class warfare or elites versus the masses is not going to unlock the American story. It might give us a sort of glance on it. It might give us a, a, a European lens on it. But I don't think it reveals an, an American understanding of the American story. And that requires us to get into, a, into the Americanness of it. And I think large state, small state, but also just state qua state, whether large or small. Mm -hmm. After all, the Senate represents each state equally, whether it's a large state or a small state. And I think that, that why a state as a state requires sovereignty of some kind of moral equivalency of a person is a very interesting question. And uh, I, I think that's something. And I would, I would, I would suggest that, that uh, one needs to spend time with the slavery issue. And that uh, I'd, rate, I'd, I'd, I'd not read the slavery issue from the outside looking in, but from the inside as the argument unfolds and where it fits in to the overall argument. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank both of our panelists, Jeremy and Gordon, as well as our participants for some really terrific questions. Uh, just a reminder, you'll be receiving that email in the next few days with a link for a certificate of participation if you would like to get that. Uh, if, you have, if you have enjoyed today's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course uh, through the Ashbrook Center. These are offered as part of our Master of Arts in American History and Government program. Uh, as uh, chair of that, uh, it's near and dear to my heart, obviously. You can find more information about Ashbrook's online course offerings at teachingamericanhistory.org. And you can also help us spread the word about these programs by sharing the archive link that you'll be receiving next week. Uh, please share that with your colleagues as well as on social media. It's the best way that we can get our message out to, uh, to teachers. Our next Documents in Detail webinar will be Wednesday. Oh, I don't have it written down. Wait a minute, but I bet I can find it really quickly. I think it is Wednesday the 24th, October 24th. Our subject at that time will be the Anti-Federalist Document Ooh. Brutus One.
Mm. At that time, I'll be joined by Dr. William Allen of Michigan State University and Dr. Todd Estes of, uh, of Oakland University. The, uh, uh, the recommended readings for that webinar have been posted, so we hope to see you back here on the evening of October 24th. Thanks again. Have a terrific evening.